Okay, next we're going to hear a uh, summary of the proposed cleanup um, for soil, groundwater, and vapor and proposed schedule. Um, we, we already went through that. Dan, 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 I accidentally did that. Okay, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll, cir we'll circle back with you at the end on that. Um, so, Regional Water Board, up next. Okay, Stephen, welcome. Hi, I'm Stephen Hill with the Water Board, and I'd like to give you a little bit of uh, a little bit of background on the regulatory aspects, and then talk about the review process for this cleanup plan. Uh, for background, uh, we use the Water Code and associated regulations and policies to require cleanup of contaminated sites. Uh, there are two sections of the Water Code that we make a lot of use of. Uh, one section, 13267, allows us to require reports and then Section 13304 allows us to require cleanup. We use both these tools at this site. Uh, we issued a site cleanup order for the site in uh, 2014, and we issued an amendment to that order uh, later that same year. Uh, taken together, they required the current landowner, Marin, Marinwood Plaza LLC, to complete a site investigation, implement some interim cleanup actions, submit a, a RAP, remedial action plan that you've heard about, and implement the RAP once we approve it. The landowner did submit a draft wrap by January 1st, which was the deadline established in the site cleanup order. Uh, and the, the uh, consultant to the landowner, uh, Dan, has just given you a, a, an overview of that, that wrap. Uh, task six of the order provides a yardstick for our review of the draft wrap. And I'll just summarize the key points. Uh, the wrap must propose remedial work, that means cleanup, that has a high probability of eliminating unacceptable threats to human health and restoring beneficial uses of water in a reasonable time, with reasonable time based on the severity of the impact. The RAP must evaluate alternative approaches to cleanup in terms of projected cost, effectiveness, benefits, and impacts on public health, welfare, and the environment. And the executive officer of the Water Board should consider the success of interim remedial actions in reducing the potential threat when evaluating the proposed uh, cleanup schedule. So we've completed an initial review of the draft wrap. We're going to take comments and consider them before we take any final action. But based on that initial review, uh, we're pleased to see a couple of features that Dan mentioned. The proposal to remove the solvent impacted soil below the, the dry cleaner. Um, and that's not contingent on site redevelopment at, at this point. We're also pleased to see a proposal uh, to block any vapor intrusion in the utility trenches nearby residences. Uh, so far we see three deficiencies in the draft wrap. I'll just touch on those briefly. It needs to address potential odors that might occur during the soil excavation. It needs to address stormwater runoff prevention during the excavation. We don't want muddy water flowing off the site. And it needs to evaluate active groundwater cleanup options to demonstrate if, they're, if they are feasible and appropriate. We still have levels over uh, drinking water standards over at the Silvera Ranch. Um, let me turn to the RAP review and approval process. Um, this is not a one-size-fits-all process. It can be simple or complex depending on the significance of the contamination and the level of public interest. And our process for this site is going to be more robust because of the high level of public interest. Uh, in January, we announced the draft RAP uh, available, availability to interested persons, uh, including nearby residents, and we started a 30-day public comment period uh, which runs through February 22nd. So that's the deadline? Yes. That's okay. the current deadline for getting written, written comments to us. February of course, 27th. we're taking them today. Uh, and we can extend that period if necessary. Uh, after the comment period, we'll review the comments and we'll determine what action should be taken on the draft round. And we have three options, really. We can approve it. We can approve it with conditions if it has minor problems. Or we can reject it if it has fundamental problems. If we reject, reject the draft wrap, this opens up the possibility of enforcement action, including fines of up to $5,000 per day. Regardless of the action that we take, we'll provide written responses to all the comments received. Um, in terms of the process, the length of the process, I've described something that, that uh, is probably going to take uh, several weeks after the comment period is closed. But again, it sort of depends on what we get and whether we wind up approving the plan or not. I'd also like to mention what happens after the RAP is approved. 
task seven of the site cleanup order proposes to complete, excuse me, uh, requires implementation of the approved RAP according to the schedule proposed in the RAP and approved by the executive officer of the water board. The draft RAP proposes to complete the active cleanup tasks within about eight months, as you saw in Dan's slide. If we conclude that that schedule is too vague or too long, we can either reject the RAP or we can establish a revised schedule and an update to our site cleanup order. Those, those are our options. In closing, I want to thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, we're interested to hear your comments. Uh, we hope this forum tonight provides you an opportunity to find out more about the project, uh, ask questions, and, and provide us with some comments. Uh, so at this point, we're done with the, the presentation part. Uh, we'd like to open it up to, to uh, questions, comments. Uh, and, to, uh, yes, so I will just will the proposed wrap come before the full board for consideration at any time? It can. It depends on, again, the comments we receive. If we sense that there's significant concerns about the wrap, then we would be more likely to bring it to the board either as a status report or as a item to be approved in the uh, I'm puzzled by the comment. I can say I'm ready for the cleanup now, but you had options. Uh, I don't understand about some of that stuff. I'm listening, but do you just want us to comment and say, please proceed with the cleanup? No. So what we want is any questions you have, some of them are being answered to the extent possible this evening. If not, they will be answered as part of the public comment process, which, as Stephen mentioned, everything will be responded to. <laughs> We also want to hear your concerns. Um, we want to hear anything on your mind related to this. And again, if you go home and think about something else next week, current deadline, February 22nd. The public comment process, um, again, is a legal process that they formally respond to. Again, I'll just give them a quick plug they're taking it also that step further here because I think we're recognizing, we being collectively everyone involved, the seriousness of this and the concerns out there. So they've come to us as well as part of that process. Let me add on to that too. Uh, there's two types of cleanup. There's a problem that's, that's affecting people right now. We require what I call interim cleanup. And some of that's already happened uh, because it's either, well, actually, because it was easy to do and we wanted to see project progress made. This is now sort of the, the, the finishing up, I would, I would term it. But the site's not fully cleaned up, but as you, as you heard from uh, our, our OEHA toxicologist, we don't see any current exposure, so we have a little luxury of time to make sure we choose a, a good cleanup plan. And that good in the sense of being effective, being acceptable to the community, and all the other factors that we're supposed to consider. Won't the site be more uh, favorable for someone to bid on development and changes if it's cleaned up, rather than waiting for a proposal for someone to come in and build it and clean it? Yes, and that's what we have in front of us now. It's a proposal to clean it up, regardless of redevelopment. And I think we all agree with that statement that it needs to be done. Um, downtown Santa Clara doing their talk to clean up with some part that's being attended. And I mentioned that you mentioned one of the things that's lacking on the current plan was, you know, keep, is there anything to be airborne while it's being cleaned? So would that be something that would be part of the plan? Would could anything be more airborne when they're actually doing the cleanup? We will ask them to look at that. Uh, it's rare to see these sites tented because usually there's just not enough um, mass of, of stuff to get into the air that calls it uh, either an unsafe condition or, or not just odorous. But we're going to require that that be uh, you know, worked on uh, so that they have monitoring, that they have an ability to slow things down or adjust things to make sure they don't cause a problem. My question addresses the discrepancy in the depth of excavating. Evidently, the plan is to excavate a 10 by 10 area to a depth of 15 feet. Um, but we've been told that um, PCEs can be found at a depth of 35 feet at least. I'm going to probably turn that yeah. over to Dan in terms of what's, what's where on the site. Uh, I think we may be mixing apples and oranges if we're talking about soil contamination, which 
doesn't miss typically think of the, it being above the water table versus groundwater contamination, which extends below the water table. I'll tell you what, let's hold that thought because I know several of the speakers are going to raise that issue. Let's tee it up and then I think we've identified Dan as the right person to address that. So we've got that one in mind. Okay, any other further preliminary? Questions? Yeah, just a quick question for, for Mr. Hill. Um, you mentioned a moment ago a significant portion of response in the public comment period. How do you define that? Can you quantify that? Not really. Um, I think one yardstick would be, is this thing going to get petitioned to our State Water Resources Control Board after we act? <coughs> if the answer is yes, then we'll, we'll take our time and make sure we do it carefully and we probably bring it to our board. Can, could you ballpark that for me? Are we talking about, you know, what, what, what kind of volume would typically end up escalating in that form? It would depend on the type of comments. Okay. So not not necessarily volume, per okay. se, but the, the type of comments that are raised and the level of uh, discomfort or disagreement that exists between what we propose to adopt, which we haven't done yet. We're still reviewing the same plan that we've distributed to everyone else. So. I mean, we're, we're looking at things like the feasibility, but we're also really thinking about the time frame because we all want to move, move forward and whether if there's areas where there seems to be disagreement within the community or within the scientists, then we could parse off that piece and move forward on other actions. There's a bunch of different ways in which this can move forward. But if, if, if there's a strong desire to have a, a, a public hearing, then we will, we will hold the public hearing. But hopefully we can answer your questions now and, and, and throughout this process. There's always also certainly availability from all of our staff by phone conversation or if a small group wanted to come down and meet with us or go over technical information, we're happy to, to do that as well. The Regional Water Board is a state agency that meets in Oakland. It's appointed by the governor. And your meetings are how? Once, once a month, the second Wednesday of the month. But we have to notice these in advance, so they'll be due notice as well. But we, we first want to gauge where, 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 where the issues are, if there are indeed issues. Yes. Two very quick notes. Tenting is not an issue. If someone brings up, we need to stop this and leave tenting. We've said that's not necessary. And then the second one is, if the tenants, Alex and Jen, that don't have a place to go, if they say, what are we going to do? We can't lose our business. Is that going to stop the development and the cleanup? The cleanup. I don't care about the development. Is there a plan a for the question. tenant who has the, to move? Uh, the landowner's representative. I understand there's a lease arrangement with the uh, liquor store operator. Is um, Tom still here? <coughs> Maybe Tom can answer. I, I, I can't address the specific lease terms with the tenant. There's confidential information between the tenant and the landlord, but I, I can't say that that's co that possibility of them vacating is addressed in the lease. So that's not a holdup. It won't be a holdup. Got a question in that? Uh, yeah, it's to have to tie on to her question. Is there a contingency plan that once this this remediate or once this wrap or this this uh, the outline of the existing project and, and cleanup takes place? that testing is done once that's all done and if there's if there's more that wasn't found or, or removed that that will be added on to the project um, yeah we always want to see empirical results afterwards to make sure it's effective um, plans are nice execution is great but we want to see that for instance the soil gas numbers stay down after the excavation occurs under the building or in the case of the uh, the offsite groundwater plume, we want to see that, that start to decline. Well, I guess what I'm getting at is if the, the owner feels that the amount of investment to take care of this as they see it now, and then once that's all taken care of, they don't just get signed off, that there might be a dip, double the cost. That's right. We're, we're basically requiring performance, not implementation of a particular project. So, so, so why don't we go for you? Um, PC has been around at this site for a while, it's well known, and now it's come to this big head. Is it because 
bridge pulled out, and now that the property's on the market, and Marcus and Millicap is actually actively marketing this piece of property, because I do understand that it is in fact the case, is that it is on the market, and I'm wondering if that's actually what's pushing this to be cleaned up. No, it's not. Um, my understanding it is, is it is on the market, but um, the factors pushing it are the uh, level of concern and the fact that it's gone on for too long and needs to be taken care of. So they, I think that they brought some presentation to clarify some point that some people of the community have and share it with the other people. Are we going to have opportunity to do that presentation? To have the presentation? Yeah, we have we, a presentation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, Stephen Nessel, everyone, another one of your neighbors um, is taping the proceeding. Yeah. I, I think that can clarify some of the questions. And Dave Cotter's got a presentation to one. Oh, I didn't understand your question, but so, once we're done with these preliminary questions, I, I have a few ideas on how we can proceed. Yeah, yeah. yeah just as a point of clarification, I want to draw the distinction between this as a public meeting or a public hearing. Any comments we make today will they be admitted to the record, or do we have to submit those in writing for them to be in the record? Great question. That'll be recorded, that is being recorded, and it will be delivered on memory stick to Ralph Heimer next week. In writing. <laughs> <laughs> That's better than in writing. You well, don't have to yeah, have to transfer. Transfer. So the, we we would we would really encourage you to submit something in writing. Um, if so we, don't have to we we have some cards here, if you want to even submit something initially in writing, or you would like us to call you and get back to you if you have questions, you can certainly do that. But it's but an email to Ralph Lander qualifies as communicating, not a handwritten letter. No, 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 it certainly does. And the fact sheet that I pointed out, which we have copies of here, also has the contact information for Ralph, the email address, a lot more information. So I'd encourage you to take that too. But, but we'd like to have you know, some of a record, and we'd like to be able to really clearly understand your comments. And we do have to finish. So, Dan, real quickly. Uh, the plume goes underneath the freeway, so that's Caltrans property. Is that going to have an impact on the process, the length of the process, how the process is done? Does Caltrans have to sign off on it? They're not easy to work with. I would agree with that. We're <laughs> looking at Caltrans uh, employees in the audience, but um, in this particular case, I don't think the difficulty of access under the freeway will actually be an impediment. To the, major sources of pollution are well away from the freeway, so we have good access there. Um, the only type of situation where it might be an issue is if we do the cleanup near the, the source, under the dry cleaner building, and, and as Dan has already described, at the eastern hotspot, and, and there's still enough stuff that's gotten away from that area that's going to keep the groundwater over the ranch at an elevated level. Uh, if that's the case, then, then there would be a need for some type of clean up to address that aspect. And, and then the Caltrans right away may be a little bit of an obstacle, but I think we can still work around that. There's property on either side. So is that the barrier that the Silvera people ask for, a barrier to stop the leaching in their property? Does that stall this cleanup, or is that just an additional part? Uh, I think it sort of depends on, on whether it's proposed and, and where and stuff like that. I think we're still in the talking stage. Uh, I understand that Mr. Trotter is going to make a presentation. Any other preliminary questions? Yes. Uh, the, the previous speaker mentioned at the very end um, something about a concern of new buildings being put up and then having contamination with those buildings. Why wouldn't the land underneath for new buildings? Why wouldn't that land be cleaned up as well? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and I think, Dan, you might be able to answer. So the toxicologist suggested there might still be some issues when new buildings are put over certain parts of the soil. Are you aware of that? The, uh, the RAP addresses that uh, in that uh, we would be monitoring mainly be soil vapor quality because the excavation should address any exceedances of the soil quality standards. But uh, at the time, depending on when people want to put up houses on the property, 
there may be residual. Well, I'm jumping ahead. And so, <laughs> and in that case, we'd be monitoring, and the most likely uh, result would be that the buildings would have to have a vapor barrier, which is a, a permeable membrane put under the building uh, with a uh, collection system to divert the vapor underneath to the rooftop. So the houses would be built with that knowledge. There, there are two possibilities here. If, if, if all of it, the mass really is under the dry cleaner building and you excavate <coughs> the, the halo of soil gas around it, you will dissipate. And so everything drops. If, if there's somehow some sort of bits of the pollution that manages to migrate a little bit away, you might still have some high soil gas. Uh, that's one of the things we'll evaluate as we're reviewing the, the, the raft, and that's one of the things we'll require monitoring to demonstrate. After the cleanup with the monitoring wells, how long afterwards does it have to be monitored? Is it going to be monitored for months or years or forever? Or when does it sell? For groundwater, it'll be years. Mm -hmm. uh, again, there's no current exposure. Uh, we have wellhead treatments on the one well that has been impacted at a low level. But uh, groundwater takes a while to cool up. Okay, yes, why don't we do two more, and then again, we'll circle back to everyone. I mean, one thing I'm curious about, we've all been talking about <coughs> on whether or not we agree with what's going in the wrap, and whether the wrap should be approved. What I'm curious about is, if it was approved today, at what point would it start to be implemented? That's a great question. As it's proposed in the draft wrap, if it was approved today, um, the active cleanup portion would be done in roughly eight months. That means the excavation under the, uh, the former dry cleaner building, that means the, the, the vapor cutoff trenches, um, mm. and additional monitoring wells to, to see what's going on with the groundwater. That's the length of time of execution. <clears throat> what I'm saying is, is there some binding action on the owner to force him to start the cleanup once it's Yes, there is. There's the site cleanup order that I mentioned earlier in my comments. Task 7 says that the, the cleanup has to happen according to the schedule proposed in the draft prep and <coughs> approved by the executive officer of the water board. Great. So, so that's, that's the hook. Thank you. Very good question. I think we have one more, and then again, we'll have plenty of time. But not exactly related directly, but is there any historical uh, cancer rate data about this area? Anywhere? There, there is a, a, a state cancer registry that keeps track of that information, um, and we have put some of your, your fellow residents in touch with some of the resources at the state and, and, and federal level. I think the feds have a, a, a comparable agency. Um, as a practical matter, we look forward to try and fix problems and avoid future exposure, so, so it's not really something that we do on a regular basis to go back and look at the health data. Okay, so now we're going to have an a open forum, and what I propose is we start out um, the Silvera family and the representative, Mr. Trotter, would like to do about a five to ten minute presentation. Uh, Bill McNicholas and his team are looking at about a 10 to 15 minute presentation. Um, I think you'll find that this will all build our knowledge base further. Um, these folks have been very intimately involved in different aspects. Then let's just pass a couple microphones around and, and really, again, questions, concerns, comments, everything on the table. So, um, Dave, why don't you start? Thanks, David, very much. Appreciate this opportunity to address the group here tonight. Uh, my name is David Trotter. I'm an attorney representing the Silvera family. I just as an aside, uh, I had my own city council meeting I was supposed to be at starting at 7 o'clock tonight, so I'm producing my own council meeting where I'm an elected official. Uh, so I'm happy to be here in Marin. I practice law over in Chautauqua County. Um, the Silvera family has reviewed the proposed RAP. They have a number of comments and serious concerns with respect to the RAP and its proposed response to the off-site migration of, PC, of the PCE plume, which has contaminated the groundwater on their property. 
And the Silvera's comments are supported by a technical review of the RAF, which has been undertaken by Fred Clark, who is a professional geologist uh, with the Source Group, Inc. And Mr. Clark's written comments on the proposed RAF will be submitted to the Water Board in a separate letter in the next few days. And I'm going to be speaking to some of the points that he has based upon his technical review. But the key point here is this. The monitored natural attenuation, which they refer to as MNA, that's being proposed in the RAP is a passive and we believe insufficient response to the residual PCE and other uh, vol volatile organic compound contamination that is both en route to the, the, the Silvera property and is already within the soils and groundwater on the site. And so, Stephen, when you talk about the fact that there is contamination Probably, most likely, there is contamination east of the eastern hotspot on the state of California property along the Highway 101 corridor, and there's no containment for it at the present time, and it's headed toward our client's property. That gives us some concern. So we're very pleased that, that in your presentation you indicated that one of the deficiencies that the Water Board staff sees is that there's not active remediation being proposed for the groundwater that's on site and already on the Silvera property. That's a very important point for us. And there are a number of reasons why we believe that, uh, that, that, um, that MNA is not a sufficient response. Uh, and let me just talk about a few of them. The first is that the attenuation is dependent on a number of different factors. And these include uh, completion of the in situ soil remediation and reduction of the PCE levels, which still hasn't happened fully on site. Um, and so when that hasn't happened, that increases the risk that there will be additional migration from the, the impacted site that will eventually get off site, go underneath the state of California property, and head on east with the prevailing groundwater. So the notion that MNA, that you just sort of monitor it and see what happens, that's a concern. And there's also concern about timeliness. Um, Mr. Clark's done some calculations, which will be shared. But basically, he calculated that the, the length of the plume currently from the source to the, the full extent of the plume on the Silvera property is about 1,950 feet. And if you make some assumptions about the, the groundwater gradient here, which is very shallow, which means it doesn't go very fast, and you do some calculations and some assumptions based upon the soils that are subsurface, his calculation is that, that for the amount of water that's in that, that 1,950 feet, the amount of time it would take for that to all turn over and go past the Silvera property is approximately 30 years. Oh. Okay, that's 30 years that conservatively we're talking about potentially having monitored natural mm -hmm. attenuation. And it could be longer if, in fact, the, the pores in the soil are not as, or tighter pores, Water doesn't move as fast and can take longer than 30 years. But his assumptions were based upon median, median, you know, grain sand, which is probably the most likely prevailing condition on site. So that's that's issue one with respect to time. The second concern that we have is that there's no data that's been presented in the wrap for the purpose of discussing uh, appropriate bioremediation techniques to eliminate the VOCs, which would be the only way you could do anything active. That would be bioremediation of one kind, we believe. Uh, there's no study of soil types. There's no studies of groundwater chemistry or bacterial type and counts. That's not presented in the RAP or the feasibility analysis. And in that regard, here's something that we believe is significant. Mr. Clark believes is significant. Uh, it's that the PCE daughter products, the thing, the breakdown products that goes from PCE to TCE to, to cis, to ethyl chloride, so vinyl chloride, and then finally to something that's not carcinogen. Um, the concern here is that based upon the current groundwater data that they've gotten, uh, it doesn't appear